Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar hosted by AmCham's Government and International Affairs Committee. I'm Una Claire Kim, Director of Government and Corporate Affairs here at AmCham, and I'm very happy to kick off today's webinar. AmCham's Government and International Affairs Committee aims to provide a forum for AmCham members to discuss and enhance their understanding of economic and political affairs in Korea and beyond. Starting with today's webinar, the Government and International Affairs Committee will be hosting a quarterly uh, speaker series as well as networking sessions in line with the committee objectives. And I'd like to thank our committee co-chairs, Jason Lee, Dongwon Kim, and Claudia Hong for their leadership and passion in driving the committee activities forward. In that context, I'm very pleased to have Paul Kong from the Luger Center in Washington, D.C. joining us today. With the recent Korean presidential election and ongoing geopolitical tensions, I personally could not think of a more appropriate topic than today's discussion. In terms of log logistics, after the speaker introduction, Paul will speak for about 30 minutes or so and then engage in a Q&A session moderated by Dongwon Kim, uh, committee co-chair and director of the Korean government engagement at G Korea. So please feel free to submit your questions by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen throughout the, uh, throughout the webinar. And let me now then hand it over to Jason Lee, uh, Committee Co-Chair and Head of Government Engagement for Visa Korea in Mongolia for a proper introduction of our speaker today. Jason? Thank you, Claire. Uh, welcome to the uh, very first Government and International Affairs Committee meeting of this year. Uh, as all of you know, opposition party candidate Yoon song yeol was elected as Quartet President of Korea last month by the closest margin of 0.7%. President elect Yoon promised the nation to bring changes in many fields, and I think overall diplomatic strategy will be certainly one of them. So today I have asked my friend uh, Paul to speak to MCM members on the topic of outlook on US Korea relations after the election. It is on invitation, but just to quickly introduce Paul again, Paul currently serves as senior fellow at Lugo Center in Washington, DC, focusing on American trade policy. China US relations, as well as domestic US politics. Before that, he was senior advisor to the US uh, Senator Richard Ruger and legislative director to the US Senator Chuck Cagle. The former was two time chairman of Senate uh, Foreign uh, Relations Committee. And as you all know, later was 24th of uh, Secretary of Defense. On the US Korea matters, he advises FKI, uh, Federation of Korea Industries, MOTI, Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy, and Director in the International Division of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, leading the Secretary of the U.S. Korea Business Council. Uh, with that, uh, let me pass it over to Paul. Paul, it's yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Um, I'm very happy to be the first speaker in your series. Um, 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 so permit me to set the scene for everyone. Um, a lot of it you, you guys already know. The election and the transition of um, the Yoon uh, administration and waiting arrived at a time where Washington is distracted with the war in Ukraine. And, and I think the same could be said in Seoul. Here in the lead up to the election here in Washington, it was actually it was pretty rare to see articles or media coverage of the uh, Korean election and anything to do with the candidates themselves. Probably, maybe in the days leading up to it, there was a few articles that popped up, like the New York Times and the Washington Post, but um, but it was pretty quiet. And um, and but now you know it, it's come and gone. Uh, we're really now looking at the immediate expectation that the two leaders are going to meet. And um, some have speculated they could meet as early as May in Seoul um, or in um, July in DC and uh, in September on the margins of the UN General Assembly. Um, it, the, the May meeting actually is um, tethered to President Biden going to Japan for a quad meeting, but that is even in doubt because of upcoming federal elections in Australia. Um, and as far as I'm aware, nothing has been announced by the White House, which already is pretty distracted uh, because they're all in Europe this week, um, in Brussels and in Poland. Um, whether the presidents Biden and you meet um, in the next several months, they will meet. And it is clear there will be a reset of relations because, you know, I think it has been pointed out um, in poll after poll in Korea, China is now understood as a threat. North Korea is a lost cause, and the U.S. is kind of the best way forward for uh, Korea. And um, 
you know, in preparation for today's webinar, I, I took some time to make some inquiries with members of the outgoing team, the members of the incoming team, and some of the folks here in Washington. And um, three items, I think, struck me um, in those conversations. And one was that Washington likes what they hear coming out of the Yoon camp. And, um, you know, uh, it's more in line with the thinking. And by thinking, I mean bipartisan thinking here in Washington, whether it's at the White House or in Congress. And um, the actions of, you know, it, it's, it's in stark contrast to some of the outgoing actions of the outgoing Moon administration and even Park Blue House before that. And that really shouldn't come as a surprise because, um, you know, if, if you believe in the, uh, if you believe in the saying that personnel dictates policy, a lot of the um, new personnel surrounding the president-elect, uh, whether it was on the campaign or on the transition, are, are members from the Lee Myung-bak era, and um, which, you know, some would argue was kind of the high point of U.S.-Korea relations because Horace got kind of pushed past the finish line after six years of negotiation in 2011. Um, you know, it was during the Obama administration, so the Green Climate Fund was something that really appealed to everyone. And then, um, and then of course, you know, he, he kind of put the investment, uh, Lee Myung-bak put the investments in, in what he called Global Korea, which kind of set the stage for what we know as Korean soft power, which is kind of the rage these days. Um, and the other part that struck me was talking to the outgoing Moon people is that they're of the mind that a lot of ground was covered in last year's summit at, in Washington at the White House. And, uh, and um, they, they feel pretty confident that the alliance is set for the foreseeable future. And, you know, you can quibble with that. And uh, to an extent, it's true. But then uh, you talk to the Yoon people and they're, they're of a different mind. Um, yeah, they, they say, yeah, a lot of the stuff was covered in um, the May summit last year between Presidents Biden and Moon, but uh, a lot of the summit deliverables haven't been carried out. And, um, you know, I think the Yoon transition are making a concerted effort to make some um, right moves, at least during the transition. And you can see that with, um, and I don't know if this is going to be fully carried out, but uh, early indications are that um, they will be only sending presidential envoys to Washington and Brussels, which, you know, sounds great to Washington. And then if you look at the order of phone calls that the president-elect made to world leaders, uh, with probably the exception of Boris Johnson, uh, the first uh, four calls were to leaders of the Quad, so the U.S., Japan, Australia, and India. So those are things I think that gets attention, especially in Washington when these things do matter. Um, so I, I, those are kind of the three items that I took away um, in preparing for this webinar and talking to as many people as I could. So um, I think you probably have before you an outline of what I wanted to cover in the main body of my remarks. And um, I think, um, you know, I thought I'd start off by talking about what the Biden people or the White House wants to go into a meeting with their first meeting with Yunnan. And of course, the top of the list is going to be North Korea. It's the low hanging fruit. Um, and, and one of the things that I think the Yun campaign wants to do is um, you know, ramp up joint military exercises. That in itself is already gonna happen um, next month in April. Um, but I think you're going to see joint military exercises uh, at the level, if not greater than the pre-moon pre years. Um, that's an easy, easy deliverable, um, and that appeals to both uh, sides. And then I think um, on North Korea, uh, there's an expectation that we really need to get back to the days where there is no daylight between the both sides on policy and be lockstep on messaging. And, you know, I think the end of war declaration kind of sideshow that was, uh, that had a shelf life of five months. So since what, well, September of last year, and it, it kind of died a slow death. Um, I, I just don't see um, Washington wanting to go through that. And there, you know, the Biden White House is really patient about that and kind of let it kind of die uh, a slow death. But um, th those are things I don't think Washington wants to see. Um, and I don't think um, you'll see that in with the Union administration coming in. On China, which is kind of the big, big, um, big thing here, um, 
I, I would imagine the, um, and it'll probably be covered when the presidential envoy comes, but they have to gauge um, Seoul's positions on China. What they've said during the campaign appeals to Washington um, and the White House. But, you know, like uh, actually following up on uh, further that deployment, which would anger China, that's, that's a serious, serious um, move and um, would certainly take Korea-China relations back to kind of the 2016-2017 period, which wasn't pleasant for Korea, um, because it would uh, contravene um, some of the uh, agreements that Seoul and Beijing came to an understanding, um, I think, in late 2017. Um, I think Washington will continue to highlight the increasingly untenable position um, of, of Seoul trying to thread the needle in trying to stay on both sides, um, um, uh, good sides. And like, Korea is not the only one uh, who, who have tried their best to do that. And I think Singapore is another example of a country that tries to stay on the, the good side of both Beijing and Washington. But I think um, the Ukraine crisis, uh, the war in Ukraine has really highlighted the fact that that is really becoming almost impossible to do. Um, and um, I think that'll be kind of something that'll be um, highlighted during any meeting. And then I think Washington, you know, kind of as a as 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 a friend and ally and a big brother, would probably tell Seoul, as Japan has been kind of doing over the last couple of years, to decrease economic exposure to China. And uh, I, I do think um, Japan is far more advanced at that right now than Korea is, but you, you'll see some of that. And I do think um, Washington welcomes kind of the liberalization of um, diplomatic talk that is gonna come out of Seoul vis-a-vis um, -vis China, um, because I think the last two administrations for sure um, have come to Washington and, and, and basically their standard line in Washington has been um, on the issue of China has been Hey, you know, you are you're a top security ally. You are. We have a mutual defense treaty, but you know, we can't really ignore China because they are our top trading partner, and and it doesn't really that that line doesn't really work here in Washington because it makes you know America out to be some mercenary force. So um, I think there will be a change in kind of language being used, um, kind of the elevator talk, as you would say. Um, and hopefully, um, and you know, I think the UN people have been saying the right things, and um, I think that will continue. Um, trilateral with Japan, um, I think that all is, you know, need of a strong reset. I, I don't think, um, I can't remember the last time the two leaders, the Prime Minister of Japan and the South Korean President met. I think it was 2019, I want to say, I could be wrong. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think it's always the case with any new administration in Seoul that they try to start a new relationship with um, Japan. And uh, as is always the case, the wheels come off pretty quickly and, and we'll see about that. And um, um, we'll see. And then um, applauding investments in America. I think, um, you know, I think last week, um, the US trade representative, Ambassador Tai, uh, kind of on the margins of the chorus 10th anniversary um, celebrations uh, joined the Korean trade minister out in Michigan at an SK factory. And I, I think it, it was just another indication of how much investment um, is coming into America. Um, and a lot of it is uh, in due credit to chorus FTA that is celebrating its 10th anniversary. Um, uh, you don't, I mean, I think a lot of you saw uh, President Biden use um, his summit meeting in May last year at the White House to to acknowledge a lot of the Korean investors' uh, investment and, and, and um, actually had, had ex Korean executives stand up and be applauded. And I think that will continue. Conversely, um, you know, um, Seoul has the new team and Seoul will have its own issues. Um, I think primarily um, one is the issue of China. And um, ever since kind of the, the Obama pivot um, to Asia, um, 10 plus years ago, um, China has become kind of the focal attention for um, Washington. And, um, you know, since those years, China has finally become a, a bipartisan issue here in Washington and a bicameral issue where the House and Senate are both in agreement. Um, the, this administration 
also has focused on China. They have an Asia czar at the White House um, by the name of Kirk Campbell. It, it does appear that he hasn't been successful in, in um, coming to an agreement in, interagency wise on a, on a China policy. Um, and and um, recently, a friend of mine who used to be the top China official at the US uh, Trade Reps office, he had penned an op-ed that Biden administration has outsourced China policy to Congress. And that, to, a, to an extent, that's true, because the only thing that's um, one of the major pieces of legislation that's working through Congress is this, um, this legislation called the America Competes Act, which is an Kind of can be viewed as an anti-China legislation, and that you know, uh, rare in itself, is a piece of legislation that typically uh, that kind of came out naturally. I mean, most legislation that passes Congress is kind of an order coming from the White House or the leadership in both parties, and this um, this anti-China legislation it just came out of nowhere. Uh, because, as I mentioned, it, it is a, a bipartisan, bicameral issue, and um, they're, you know, they're looking to um, help American industry in um, competing with China. And I think it's, um, as of this week, it, they're, they're heading to conference, which means the House and Senate versions of the bill will be negotiated to come to an agreement on a final bill that the president can sign. Um, I think another concern, um, besides who controls China policy, um, which is kind of how uh, the Biden administration sees um, through the prism for Asia. Um, I think another concern probably coming from the Yun people will be, um, and it works both ways, a lack of experts in the senior ranks. And, you know, I think uh, much has been documented about how long it took for the Biden White House to announce a nominee to be ambassador to South Korea. And, and, and you know, I, maybe uh, perhaps it's a reflection of how thin the ranks are at the top on Korea matters. Um, and, and the same could be said here in Seoul, where, um, you know, there's many, many articles about how the um, North America um, experts at Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs were sidelined during the last five years. The, the so-called Washington School, and um, you know, I, I do. I'm, I'm I'm someone of the opinion that if the Washington School were in positions of um, authority here uh, during the Moon administration, um, you know, stuff like the end of end of war declaration probably would have um, been dealt with differently. Um, and so we'll see um, where uh, if they if those guys make a comeback. But um, I, I do think um, the ranks of senior experts on both sides are thin. I think that's going to change in the next five to ten years. Certainly on the American side, where there are a lot of people coming up through the ranks who are very experienced on Korea. And um, and then I think um, there's a general worry, and not just Seoul, but from most countries, um, that there is a reluctance on the part of Washington to engage on trade and economic issues um, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, uh, I think with yesterday's announcement that um, the steel 232 tariffs will probably be lifted for the United Kingdom, um, Korea is really the last one standing uh, because I think uh, the Biden administration has already taken care of the EU and Japan. Well, that is a concern and you know they should make it an issue. And, um, you know, I, I was someone that was hopeful that last week's 10th anniversary, of course, was like the perfect, was the perfect occasion to uh, lift, um, come to an agreement on the tariffs on steel. Um, we'll see. And then, um, you know, I think um, there's a lot of disappointment that um, the digital trade um, was, is a low hanging fruit when it comes to Asia. And it's something that doesn't harm really many people here in Washington. And, um, and I think, um, you know, Ambassador Tai hasn't really engaged on the issue of digital trade. And uh, I know it's um, mentioned in passing in um, passages of the Indo-Pacific Economic uh, Framework, which is, which is the uh, vision that the Biden administration sees here uh, in Asia. Um, but we'll see. I think, um, you know, we'll, we'll see about digital trade. And I know it's a focus for many of the member companies of AmCham, um, whether that's going to proceed. Um, I know Chris, Korea is proceeding on their own on that uh, matter. And um, Ukraine. Um, Ukraine is a harbinger of U.S. and its national interest. I, I, 
I, um, I, I mentioned that in passing as kind of um, less about U.S. getting involved if something were to happen in Korea, because they will, they, have, uh, they are a treaty ally. But I think much more to do with how North Korea is reacting to um, or would react and lessons learned from what's happening with the war in Ukraine. It, 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 it probably, uh, as others have said in the think tank world, it really does reinforce that no one's going to attack a country that has nuclear weapons. And like with Russia right now, um, no one, you have a lot of countries who are really um, afraid to um, um, challenge them and th they are definitely treated differently, a nuclear power is treated differently and you're seeing that now in Russia. So those are kind of where both sides are coming from. Um, I think on the issue of uh, potential sources of bilateral stress over the next two and a half to five years. Um, one is that in Seoul and, 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 and in Washington, there's going to be divided government for at least in Seoul for two years. Um, I think uh, the National Assembly uh, ruled by the soon to be um, opposition party is, um, will start flexing their muscle, that much is clear. Um, and, and on other matters, probably non-national security related matters, they are going to have a lot of say. And I think here in Washington, we were pretty startled by what the National Assembly did last year on the App Store payments bill. Um, if more of that stuff comes through the pipeline, um, I, I know that's going to get the attention of uh, authorities here in Brussels and elsewhere. Um, but we'll see. Um, we'll, um, there's talk about the trade portfolio and in, in uh, the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy in Korea being transferred to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, but that involves the National Assembly having to sign off on the restructuring. And, and um, most people think um, the new government's honeymoon period with, with the um, new administration will be about three weeks because of local elections set and um, due to take place in, on June 1st. So um, we'll see how long the honeymoon period lasts, um, but um, they, they obviously from the outset can influence parts of foreign, foreign and economic security policy. And um, I think that's, um, I think a lot of people will pay attention to that. And of course, um, bilateral stress, um, not only, um, maybe the lower house of Congress uh, switching parties and become, uh, becoming Republican led. Uh, I think there is um, fear that um, President Trump will uh, return to power in 2024, which probably um, is, you know, if, if he makes that, it's his choice and I think he'll clear the field. Um, but, you know, um, be, when he was leaving office, um, I don't think President Moon had some kind words to say to him. I think it was, in an interview with Time, and he's a man who doesn't forget these things. And, um, and, and uh, there's a fear that President Yoon will pay the price for some of the things President Moon said about Biden on his way out. Um, we'll see. Um, but you know, what's, what's much more, um, I think, uh, scary for countries like Korea is um, after uh, one term in office, Trump actually does know how to use levers of power now. So th there is um, that should get anyone's attention. Um, I think there's, it's talk of Silicon Valley. Um, I think it's talk of a lot of industries, but the competition authorities, um, certainly on the Washington side, they're fully staffed. It, you have um, the head of the Federal Trade Commission, um, Lena Khan, a 33 year old chair of this competition regulatory body that uh, made a name for herself. Um, with one amazing uh, law review article when she was at Yale, um, advocating for the breakup of Amazon, and that propelled her to the chairmanship of the FTC, which is just unheard of. And um, not only that, but um, you, I think it was highlighted in the, the December meeting between the heads of the um, competition bodies here in Washington and the European, their European counterparts, it, it, it was kind of the climax of a year where you're seeing more and more uh, cooperation and coordination with um, um, the co commissioners over in Europe. And, um, and I think that is sh shaking uh, different industries. 
Um, I know um, certainly from a, a U.S. standpoint, um, the U.S. and EU coming together on competition is 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 going to shock many many economies, um, and I think Korea will be no exception. Um, and then, lastly, I kind of threw this in there because um, with the with so many companies and industries leaving Hong Kong, Seoul has kind of uh, miraculously become the regional news hub in Asia. And um, you're seeing them staff up. I think they're still staffing up. Um, but I think that's going to be a source of tension um, because a lot of them are American media outlets. And a lot of what they're going to be churning out will be um, hostile to China. Um, I, and I think um, Beijing will probably put a lot of pressure on Seoul to um, to shut down or, or silence, if that's even possible, um, some of these regional news hubs, um, because what to, to Beijing, what's going to spew out of Seoul will be what they view as propaganda and hostile to Chinese interests. So, um, and Seoul is going to be kind of stuck between, uh, in between the two great powers, um, especially um, with, you know, in the lead up to the party congress uh, in October and November in Beijing, where um, Xi Jinping is looked to um, is looking to get his next five years term uh, term in office. So um, I think we'll see that pretty quickly um, in the lead in the next couple of months. Um, I spoke about the negatives. So what are the positives in the bilateral setting? Um, I think one is that um, the last five years showed what engagement or what engagement can do or what we can't really walk away with. And, um, you know, I, I don't think the leadership in, um, I think the leadership in North Korea and Pyongyang, um, they'll probably never see um, a South Korean president as um, friendly than um, the outgoing president. And, you know, they got lucky also with um, President Trump's time in office where he was willing to roll the dice. And, um, you know, I think we saw that they're, they're really not willing to engage on stuff that we want, uh, Seoul and Washington want, which is denuclearization. And uh, what, what um, Pyongyang wants is uh, relief from sanctions. And, and, and then a lot of times they just want attention. And, um, and uh, we saw what comes of that. And, um, I, and I know the incoming UN administration has very little um, interest in engaging at the level that the Moon president did, President Moon did. Um, and, you know, if you look at kind of the track record of the Biden administration over the last 15 months, you know, um, they were very patient. Um, they didn't give Pyongyang the kind of attention that they wanted at different times. And, uh, and um, so we'll see how that turns out um, starting in May. Um, I, 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 they'll definitely be more coordinated. Um, on policy vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. Um, there's a strong Korea caucus in Congress and, uh, and, I, and many of you probably know there's uh, four Korean American members of Congress now, uh, two on each side, which makes it very convenient. Um, I'm not dismissing the non-Korean members of Congress who are very experienced on policy, but um, in Young Kim, who's a Republican from California and Andy Kim, who is a Democrat from New Jersey, you have very, very uh, smart uh, students of foreign policy who are polished, um, who, uh, who are gonna lend a big voice and a megaphone when it comes to Korea policy um, here in Washington. And, um, and you, know, you saw some of that with um, Young Kim pretty much putting the final nail in the coffin on the end of war declaration um, um, at the end of the year. So. Um, you know, she carries a lot of weight. Um, I think Andy uh, probably carries a lot of weight on the Democratic side. And, you know, they're not afraid to speak out. And um, even if it's in the, not in the interest of Seoul, they're definitely going to speak out. Um, also, I think uh, you're, you're seeing much more savvy navigation of Washington by um, the government in Seoul and um, even conglomerates, the Chebels in Korea. Um, I think the days of uh, visiting members of the National Assembly going to malls between meetings of shopping trips or, or, or in outlets, those, those days are over. They, uh, when they come, the delegations from the National Assembly, they have serious meetings, whether with, with their counterparts in Congress or um, with think tanks and other members of civil society. Um, that will continue. 
and, um, and, and that will only increase. And then at the same time, you have, um, and I think it's been pretty well documented in the Korean media, um, a lot of the chevals are staffing up and a lot of their offices in Washington are now led by um, pretty prominent people. Um, uh, I think everyone knows that um, Mark Lippert now leads the Washington office here in Washington, uh, Washington office for Samsung. Um, Kande is led by a former assistant secretary of uh, defense. Um, and then um, like Kup even Kupang has a, has a I, don't, I wouldn't say a heavyweight, but like a, a senior Trump official who uh, leads the Kupang office in Washington. So um, you're seeing much more savvy navigation uh, by Korean players um, in Washington. And then, um, as I mentioned, um, there is a delayed turn in mood regarding China in Korea. Um, I don't know how much the Winter Olympics impacted that. I, and I say delayed because I just thought it would have been around when um, China cracked down um, in, during the Fed crisis uh, five, six years ago, um, where um, they shut down all the Lotte uh, uh, stores in China and they emptied out the streets of Yongdong and Jeju-do uh, of tourists. Um, but um, you know, the delay turn in mood in Korea is probably very healthy for the US-Korea relationship. And, um, and um, I, I, I see that as a positive and, um, and, and it naturally should be because um, you know, Korea is a US, uh, uh, an ally of US and which shares a mutual defense treaty. So um, I'll end it there. Um, I, I think I probably came in a little early, but um, I know there's um, questions to be asked and I'm happy to answer them now. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Paul, for, for your insights. I think uh, some of the comments you made was very, very interesting, very insightful. Um, I, I, I kind of disagree on one thing about the, 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 the honeymoon period between the, the, the Yoon government and the going out uh, moon government uh, lasting three weeks. I think it's already over. Um, you know, <laughs> there, are issues, there are issues with uh, moving the Blue House uh, to Yongsan and all those things. And I think... Um, it's going to be a very tough uh, for for at least uh, two years until the next uh, um, uh, uh, national assembly elections. Because again, uh, the ruling party has the current ruling party has over 70, 170 uh, uh, seats in the national assembly. So again, it's it's it's, it's a very interesting time uh, for for I think for both countries. Um, having said that, I will encourage uh, our. Uh, Amcham members to uh, to uh, write down your questions if you have any. I'll start off some of the questions that 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 uh, came in earlier. Um, and one of the things is that uh, in the Biden Moon Summit last May, one of the key strategic industries, uh, I think you also kind of mentioned this in your speech, uh, where the two agreed to collaborate further was a digital economy. And Korea also recently completed a digital partnership agreement uh, with Singapore, which includes uh, you know. Uh, liberal provisions like uh, ease of cross-border data flows. Uh, how do you think the US and Korea could enhance their cooperation on digital trade going forward? And do you see a significant uh, potential for cooperation uh, through the Indo-Pacific economic uh, framework? I think I touched on some of that. Um, I right. think um, digital trade, digital economy is something that um, the Biden White House does see as something that can be done. Um, interestingly, uh, there are it's it's not a unified front. It, it's it's the the advocacy is really coming from the White House. And um, there's a there's a really interesting um, article that a former Wall Street Journal um, reporter Bob Davis wrote in for Politico that kind of covers um, the history of the Indo-Pacific economic uh, framework and. It talks about some of the issues that made the cut, and digital happened to be one of them because it was one of the non-contentious issues that you know the Democratic base didn't see a problem with. Um, so you would think that they would um, certainly the USTR office would engage on digital trade, but they haven't done so. And from uh, everything I've heard, um, there is some uh, friction on that matter because for the White House, it's an easy win. It's an easy way to engage with ASEAN and um, some of the other countries. Um, I don't think you see that coming out of say Japan because it is um, digital was covered in their kind of mini trade deal back in 2019. Um, but the others are, are eager to engage and, um, and uh, um, we'll see about that. Um, it's um, digital, 
it's in every document, but you don't see any movement, and which is kind of peculiar. Uh, thanks. Uh, the next question I wanted to ask you is that uh, the reports I think that came out yesterday um, that the new U.S. ambassador for Korea, uh, Phil Goldberg's uh, confirmation hearing is scheduled for early April. And as you know, uh, we have not had a U.S. ambassador to Korea for, I think, almost a year or, or over a year. I can't remember exactly. But when do you think, uh, you know, he'll be able to come down to Korea. I know that we have some <laughs> friends at the embassy um, uh, attending the meeting as well. Uh, so well, be, mindful, be mindful of that. And could you tell us a bit about the new ambassador and you know how the U.S.-Korea relationship will advance in the Yoon um, Biden era uh, with, with the new ambassador uh, coming in? Well, I think he's got to be ecstatic that um, he's coming in at a time where um, you have a government who's saying all the right things that please it, that, that you know, really makes Washington happy. Um, in terms of timeline of his confirmation, you know, I, 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 I'm a former Senate staffer and, you know, the Senate has um, authority on um, confirmation of senior officials like him. And um, they can really slow walk that. Um, but, you know, I think it's an interesting case to be made about conf confirming him um, pre-inauguration, uh, which is what May 10th. Um, having him in place at the inauguration is, is valuable, I think. And, um, you know, I think circumstances dictate that. Um, uh, like two examples that come to mind is recently, um, a friend of mine actually uh, is, uh, was nominated to be war crimes prosecutor for the State Department. And she was probably looking at a six month process from nomination to confirmation, if that. And, um, you know, the war in Ukraine and then the war crimes being committed over there um, sped up her confirmation and she zipped through the entire Senate and she, she was, she's confirmed in, um, in, in record time. So um, events do dictate. And I, I do think, um, uh, for example, I think uh, uh, Sung Kim back in 2011, his confirmation was kind of up in the air and, and they, they made an effort to confirm him while Congress was debating chorus, uh, passing chorus on the eve of um, his state visit in, I wanna say October, 2011. And um, it made very, it would have been pretty silly to host the South Korean president without a U.S. ambassador in place confirmed. And, uh, and I think, I think I want to say the day before the state dinner at the White House, Sung Kim's nomination got confirmed. So, so events do uh, change um, uh, what is typically a very slow process. And um, I would be quite surprised if um, he, he's not confirmed before the inauguration. Thanks. Um, I think this is a question from um, Ho Young from AWS. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, it's reported that uh, you and Biden summit, well, as you, I think you also kind of briefly mentioned this in your speech, uh, will, uh, there, there is a possibility that this will happen in May. And what, what are your views on the summit and expectations out of, out of that summit if, if that's likely to happen? Well, May summit basically doesn't give much time for at least one side to prepare, right? They won't be fully staffed. Um, I, I think you mentioned the move, uh, moving offices. They won't be unpacked. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think President Biden's trip to Europe this week showed you can pull off a visit in record time. I think um, he signed off on his trip to Poland 10 days ago, and he's going to be in Poland in, on Friday. So these things can happen on the fly. Um, you don't need months and months to prepare for it. It, it. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, everyone has to work overtime, but it's doable. But, you know, you're going, uh, if they meet in May, uh, they won't have, you know, the defense minister or the, the foreign minister, even um, their nominations confirmed by the National Assembly. So, I mean, it'll be, I imagine a, a, and where would he go? Um, is he going to go to the, the, the former defense ministry? Like, where would they meet? Um, I mean, I know there's, there's a lot of things that uh, the American president can do. I mean, I'm, I'm sure he'll go to Camp Humphreys. There are other things that he can do while in Korea, but where would they meet? I and mean, these are very kind of um, diplomatic questions, which, you know, need to be answered. Um, and, um, and uh, if they meet, it'll be, I can't imagine it'll be more than perfunctory, like a photo op, kind of a on the fly photo op. And no, you can't really have serious discussions when your your team isn't fully, fully in place. Um, I have a couple of uh, security related questions. Um, okay. 
do you think the I mean the ongoing again this is the to hot topic for everybody um Ukraine and uh the Ukraine crisis will have an impact on North Korea's behaviors and and you know how the U.S. and Korea will approach uh, the new denuclearization of North Korea going forward. I mean, it's it's. I think this is like on top of everybody's mind right now, not just in Korea but in the U.S. as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I've um, there's been several think tank events um, on related to this, and uh, and I, I don't think I'm saying anything new, but um, um, it, it, I feel uh, as I think I mentioned before, I think the crisis in Ukraine reinforces some of uh, Pyongyang's positions on um, having nukes, right? Um, if you have a nuke, you're not gonna get invaded. If you, if, if, if you, if you don't have a nuke, you'll just get easily invaded, like attacked, uh, like Ukraine has. And then, um, you know, uh, President Putin was quick to kind of use, uh, threaten the use of nuclear weapons that got a, a lot of people's attentions. And, and um, you saw Europe and um, Washington, Brussels and Washington, drawing red lines so it wouldn't escalate any further. And, and you know, with nuclear weapons, a nuclear weapon state can do that. So, I mean, it's just, I think if anything, it reinforces what they probably see on any crisis on the Korean peninsula. Um, I, I think hopefully um, the new UN administration takes the road that um, um, the Biden administration has taken with uh, North Korea over the last 15 months, which is really just patience, patience, and just um, engaging in kind of very small dialogue with them or trying to get them out. Um, but, you know, from the standpoint of Washington, even the non-proliferation nuclear issues, it's secondary to kind of some of their diplomacy right now happening vis-a-vis -vis Iran. I think um, they want to, re they are re-engaging. They're, they're trying to get um, Iran to, um, to really not cross the threshold. And uh, I think a lot of attention is on Iran right now. And, uh, you know, um, as North Korea, um, you know, sends projectiles up in the air, um, you know, pretty frequently, you don't see Washington in like panic mode. And I think that will probably continue. Um, and I'm sure Washington is also hoping that Beijing steps in kind of later in the fall when, um, as I mentioned, the 20th Party Congress will take place, um, which will be, you know, for Beijing, uh, 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 an enthronement, a crowning um, of a third term for Xi Jinping, and they just won't allow North Korea to make a big fuss surrounding um, the events of the Party Congress in, in late fall, October and November. Thanks. Um, I think you also kind of mentioned it, but this question came in from Tyler Wan of um, KNL Gates, mm -hmm. and uh, it's about it's a question about IPEF. Um, Moti has spoken positively about IPEF, and uh, he wanted to know more about your views on the IPEF and how do you see this playing out between U.S. and Korea, and also uh, with with China. Um, I think. So um, one of the things I, I probably didn't mention is, um, and I think many of um, the people in this audience know, is the outgoing um, Moon administration has um, not formally applied to join uh, C CPTPP and um, was um, adamant on consulting with whoever was elected in, um, in filing its application in April. Um, that kind of on the backs of just full knowledge that Washington is not interested in, in CPTPP. And um, IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Forum, is the only rodeo right now of how Washington is going to engage with the Indo-Pacific. Um, it's, it's really, um, it, it's a kind of, if, you know, from the standpoint of um, Seoul, it's really interesting because you know they're, they're going to make some great investments in trying to become members of IPF. Probably going to ask um, Washington's help in um, in in getting in with difficult members like Japan. I imagine is going to make things quite difficult for membership, um, and Washington is going to be key in um, in helping Seoul. Um, but you know, I, I don't think 
kind of it's in the interest of Washington to help Seoul join CPTPP because they're not even joining. They're not a member and they're not really interested in joining. Um, so IPEF is the only rodeo in town, but like you read through their announcements, um, it, it's still not kind of, um, you, you kind of have a skeletal frame. You, you're just not sure how much they're going to invest in it. Um, we'll see in the coming months how much they do invest in it. I mean, um, they're allowing APEC to take the lead on some of these issues that they've outlined. Um, we'll see. Um, it, 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 I, I, I'd like to tell Tyler, it's, I think it's too early to, um, to really, I mean, we don't even have a coordinator, right? I mean, I think um, when you have assigned two agencies, in this case, um, the Department of Commerce and the USTR to do jointly do this, like those things never work out. I mean, it's, it's just, um, it's, it's kind of a fool's errand. And um, yeah, I, I have views, I, I probably isn't really formed yet on the future of IPF, but, but I think um, since it's the only um, show on, in town, I, I do think Washington, um, Seoul needs to engage and see where this goes because it might it might count for nothing or um, it you know it might be kind of the the economic piece of a quad thing and um, who knows what, where things are going to go. Thank you. Um, we've got another question from the audience um, and it's about um, asking uh, if you could elaborate further on which options U.S. could see for Korea's strong export import relationships with uh, China how to refine that then you know what will be potential key points for for discussion on in a in conversations between the US and Korea i think that's the the yeah the, the. well um, i think one thing the ukraine war has really highlighted for the korean government is on a on a whim, um, export control kicks in and life becomes really, really, really difficult. Um, and while Russia, Russia's impact on the Korean economy is very, very minimal, um, and, and I, when I mean minimal, I, I don't want to uh, kind of uh, dismiss, you know, six percent um, uh, energy imports as minimal, but like. Um, it could be much, much severe if such measures were applied to China. And, and, and the threats are out there right now. If, if China gets heavily involved in the war in Ukraine, these things are, are, um, are kind of around the corner. And I think the Korean government knows that. And, and if they're smart, they're preparing for that. Um, and I think, um, you know, and, and We'll see how long the Russian economy survives because, um, you know, I think the U.S. Department of Commerce is getting really, really good at this now. I mean, uh, I think everyone knows what happened to Huawei um, and uh, Huawei examples is a clear kind of scalp that everyone can see as what happens when Washington actually gets gets it straight, um, whether it's Huawei or or entire economy that Russia is. And I think um, next in line, they're targeting different sectors. So um, I, I think there's lessons to be learned. Um, and you know, I, I don't even think uh, the Biden administration has to come to a meeting with uh, President Yoon and say, listen, this is what happens. You need to like wake up. And um, because I think a lot of countries are waking up to the reality of, um, of crossing um, the American sanctions regime, because, uh, you know, up to this point, the, the only real um, economy that really saw the kind of the severity of that was Iran. And um, now you're just, um, you're seeing Russia going through this whole process and threats uh, to the Chinese economy. And I think uh, um, you, you will see, um, even before any dictates from the Korean government, you, you're going to see industry kind of um, taking measures into their own hands to uh, protect themselves. Thanks. Thanks for that, Paul. Um, this question came in from Hana Miao. Um, uh, her question is, do you think there's possibility or is it appropriate protocol for USTR to convey its official position to the Presidential Transition Committee on some of the trade barriers coming from excessive regulations of Korea and certain industries? You know, as you commented uh, on Chorus FTA, the, the 10th anniversary, uh, some of the issues that Ambassador Tai picked up uh, that Korea should improve including issues on automobiles, flexible regulations in agriculture, biotech, so forth. So is this something that should be considered in a positive way by the new government? 
Yes. Um, but at the same time, I think, um, you know, um, if you read Korean media reports, and I'm sure USTR is the same way, um, you're going to see a fundamental restructuring of the trade portfolio and where it lands is, is, uh, is anybody's guess. Um, but um, in terms of USTR engaging with the union transition, I, I just don't see it. Um, of course, the, uh, you know, and even when they send um, the presidential envoy, I can't imagine the US, uh, uh, the Korean presidential envoy who comes to Washington, I think um, later uh, next month, um, will be meeting with every cabinet official. Um, I, I, I think they may, uh, he or she may uh, meet with uh, Ambassador Tai. Certainly will try to, I mean, it probably makes sense to meet more with um, Amb Secretary Raimondo, who's the uh, Secretary of Commerce because of kind of her, and her department's role in um, export control vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine. Um, but um, I, I, I just don't see um, any dialogue happening anytime soon. Um, and you know, I think um, last week's events surrounding the 10th anniversary was probably the last Korea was gonna see of um, Ambassador Tai for, the, for a couple of months now. And I think um, she's, um, she has other um, items on her agenda and um, I don't see, um, uh, unless it's kind of recruiting Korea to be a full-fledged member of um, IPF, uh, I, I, I just don't see much engagement, in the, at least in the immediate future. Um, yeah, thanks. I have another follow-up question uh, regarding security issues, and one of the one of the biggest issues during the elections uh, and, and and the election to, um, that took place about three weeks ago was the uh, the operation of um, THAAD. Um, missile uh, defense, um, that was a big issue. And again, that, that is a sticky issue, not just for Korea, but it relates to the US and um, China as well in that matter. And again, I mean, we've been talking about China for a long time. What would you, what your, what would your advice to, uh, to the new Moon administration on, again, um, this is more of a broader issue dealing with these sticky issues that concerns uh, both China and, mm -hmm. and the US. And again, what, what's your uh, views on, on, on the THAAD um, relocation and establishment? Well, on THAAD, a further deployment of THAAD runs in direct contravention of the agreement from 2017, where um, I think Seoul wore out Beijing's patience, like Korea won, where um, China like backed down and just accepted the that that was placed put in place that started the whole thing. But um, to make bygones be bygones, um, they agreed to the three no's, which was there will not be another further deployment of that, and a few other things that they won't be a security alliance with Japan, and, and uh, there was one more, and I can't remember what. So. So Yoon would be coming in, and if he forced this issue, you're running, you're running afoul of um, the agreement that kind of put that put to rest um, the dispute, the original dispute. Um, but you know, I, I, I think, I think, I think the Australia model in recent years, where like economic coercion worked to a degree, and if you just weather it, like they they'll eventually back down. Uh, if that's the calculation. Um, and Korea is willing to do that, I, I, you know, bravo to uh, President Yoon. Um, but I think he has to prepare the country for another kind of uh, period of hardship. And um, if they're willing to do that, I, I think they should. And I think America should be much more supportive um, than they were um, during the original Thad crisis because the, the help didn't really come in uh, from the Obama administration. And yes, it was in the last years of the Obama administration, but um, the help at least um, either vocally or visually wasn't there. And, um, and I, I can't imagine if they were to do that again, um, they wouldn't do it without strong kind of assurances from Washington that they would back them up. And um, I, I, I think um, if I were to advise them that that's something that should be, um, that would be the smart move is, is get assurances that this, they're not gonna be kind of, uh, flying solo on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, for everything. Uh, I think this was a very insightful session. And again, I mean, I'm just 
thinking uh, out loud here, but I think it'll be very interesting to have you back like in six months after the new uh, administration kicks in and then we'll kind of see how the relation has evolved in the first six years. So again, um, we'll, we'll like to, uh, again, suggest that you come back, I don't know, maybe six months or, or a year in and kind of assess the conversation that we, we just had and, you know, um, kind of see uh, where, where, where we are uh, uh, there. I would be happy to do that. I would be happy. Um, this, was, this was a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Uh, Clara, do you want to close off um, with your closing remarks? Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Paul, for your very insightful and I would say very comprehensive um, presentation uh, on issues raising, ranging from security to trade to economy. I mean, uh, clearly you're an expert on, on the, in the field and uh, we really appreciate uh, your insights and uh, we, you know, very enlightening Q&A session as well. Um, so thank you very much and thank you to the, the audience for uh, your questions and being, uh, you know, giving us this very dynamic discussion uh, today. And um, for those of you who might have missed some of the, the discussion today, we will have a recording of today's webinar uh, through our YouTube channel uh, in a few days. So please tune, tune into that uh, if you'd like to hear more about what we discussed. And also, if you have any questions about our Government and International Affairs Committee, please feel, feel, uh, feel free to reach out to our committee co-chairs, Duan, uh, Jason, or myself, uh, and we'll be happy to engage you on that. Um, and without further ado, I'd just like to thank everyone, uh, including our speakers, and I look forward to seeing you in the near future in our, our next uh, webinar. Thank you.